So the most common form of bicarbonate that we give to our patients is sodium bicarbonate. Once you give it to the patient, it will dissociate into sodium. It will be a source of sodium. So you may actually increase sodium concentration by, by giving sodium bicarbonate, but also it will dissociate into a bicarbonate itself that eventually may lead to formation of carbonic acid and it will now dissociate into water and CO2. So if you give a ton of sodium bicarbonate to a patient that cannot breathe well, for example, it has upper airway obstruction, that may actually elevate their CO2 level because sodium bicarbonate is the source of CO2. So Whenever you're thinking about any treatment, you absolutely need to consider risks and benefits of this treatment. And bicarbonate administration is not the exception. So there are a lot of different potential risks with sodium bicarbonate, and that may be one of the reasons we typically don't use it a lot in veterinary medicine. So first of all, it can cause metabolic alkalosis. It can cause hypercapnia that we just mentioned. It can cause hypernatremia. It can cause hypocalcemia because metabolic alkalosis will increase binding of calcium to albumin. It may cause hypokalemia because potassium will be pushed into the cells due to metabolic alkalosis. It can cause paradoxical CNS acidosis. So with paradoxical CNS acidosis, what happens is that when you give bicarbonate, it will dissociate eventually into water and CO2. CO2 will easily get across the blood brain barrier and accumulation of CO2 may cause acidosis. So we call it paradoxical CNS acidosis, but also there will be a portion of bicarbonate in the form of HCO3. So this form of bicarbonate will not be able to cross brain blood barrier easily. However, CO2 is a much smaller molecule, so it can easily diffuse across this barrier so that there will be excessive accumulation of CO2 inside the CSF, but there will be not much bicarbonate in there. So as a result, the accumulation of CO2 can create this paradoxical CNS acidosis because CO2 will combine with water in the CSF. And as a result, it, that eventually can lead to hydrogen ion accumulation. And finally, the sodium bicarbonate solution typically is very hyperosmolar unless you dilute it out uh, with fluid. And that may be very irritating to the vein in theory, the only benefit of sodium bicarbonate is improved metabolic acidosis. So as you can see here, a lot of different risks and not many benefits. So therefore, again, again, that's the reason we don't use it every single day. All right. So now we're going to talk about this decision making. In what case I actually can consider giving bicarbonate and in what cases it's probably going to be not a great idea. So first, you want to know the acid-base diagnosis. So I would never recommend giving bicarbonate to a patient that you don't have acid-base analysis for. So it's important to have this blood gas available before you consider it. So if your acid-base analysis shows that patient has a metabolic alkalosis, a respiratory acidosis, or respiratory alkalosis, you do not want to give sodium bicarbonate because all of these conditions may get worse with bicarbonate therapy. Now, if your patient has metabolic acidosis, you may want to continue thinking about possible bicarbonate administration. So if the type of metabolic acidosis, this high anion gap metabolic acidosis, bicarbonate administration actually may not be ideal because a lot of this unmeasured anions will get converted into bicarbonate later. So the exception might be cases where pH is extremely low. So let's say you have a dog with pH of 6.8, less than 7, and this patient has refractory shock. It's on vasopressors, but blood pressure is still very low. It may have uremic acidosis. It may have high potassium. So if you have a combination of these factors, super low pH, refractor shock, high potassium, maybe uremic acidosis, even if it's just high nine gap metabolic acidosis, you may consider sodium bicarbonate. 
but those cases are rare when you see a combination of these findings. So if you have a patient that has normal NAN gap metabolic acidosis or combination of normal and high NAN gap metabolic acidosis, then you want to look for the following criteria. So if pH is very low, less than 7.1, and partial pressure of CO2 is also low, because remember, bicarb administration may increase your CO2. If it's already high and you have, let's say, a mixed disorder where there's respiratory acidosis plus normal NN gap metabolic acidosis, you probably don't want to use bicarb because CO2 will get worse and that's not good. So one of the criteria should be low CO2. So it should be at least less than 45. If you have that and patient is either in refractory shock, not responsive to vasopressor, or has blood potassium greater than six or seven, so it's hyperkalemic even without shock, you may consider bicarbonate administration. Another indication that you may see in the literature is prolonged CPR. If your patient does not meet a few of these criteria, you probably do not want to give sodium bicarbonate. And if the patient does meet this criteria, you may consider giving it. Again, you don't have to in all of these cases, but at least it's something you can justify. So there are certain bicarbonate administration rules that I think are important whenever you're considering giving bicarbonate. So rule number one, you want to make sure your patient has normal ventilatory ability. It has either normal or low partial pressure of CO2 because it may get worse if it's already elevated. Rule number two, you want to give it slowly, ideally over several hours if possible and incrementally. So either as a CRI or very small doses. The worst thing you can do is to give a large amount of bicarb over a short period of time, and that may create potential for a lot of complications. Rule number three, you want to frequently monitor an acid-based status as you do bicarbonate therapy, and your pH goal should be about 7.2. So again, you don't want to normalize pH back to complete normal 7.4, is in a lot of these cases, eventually you will overshoot and the patient will develop metabolic alkalosis that may cause a lot of problems. So it's important to just do as minimum as possible to just return pH back to 7.2, but not to completely normal value. And rule number four is you want to consider its osmolality when giving by peripheral vein. So the typical guideline that the osmolality of the solution should be less than 600 milliosmoles per liter. So in the Excel spreadsheet calculator, there is a tab for osmolality. So you can actually plug in your numbers and put the concentration and volume of your bicarbonate solution and the other fluids you're giving to the patient, and that will give you the value for osmolality. So if it's greater than 600, it's probably not okay for the peripheral vein and if you cannot dilute it further, you need to use the central line. All right, so now we're going to talk about oral bicarbonate. It's not something we do all the time. There are rare cases that will need oral bicarbonate. And typically, those cases are managed by like internal medicine clinicians and not ER or critical care clinicians. However, you may deal with a few of them. By far, the most common indication for oral bicarb will be renal tubular acidosis, such as with type 1 or type 2 RTA. So if we go back to Rex, you remember he was our 8 kilogram dachshund who had suspected RTA type 2 secondary to pyelonephritis. Definitely this type of patient may potentially benefit from oral bicarbonate, especially if RTA persists despite the initial acute management and you need to send this patient home, but it has very severe metabolic acidosis. Um, there are different forms of oral bicarbonate. One of the most common ones would be this 650 milligram tablets. And 650 milligram tablet contains about eight milliequivalents of bicarbonate. And one MAQ of bicarbonate equals to 84 milligram. So if our patient is eight kilo dog, and we decided to start kind of low, even though uh, we think he had type 2 RTA, which you see it's greater than 10 mq per day per day, I always recommend start low and, and if needed, titrate it up. 
So in this case, we're going to start at low dose, 8 times 3. That will be 24 MAQs per day of sodium bicarbonate. Now you can split this dose and give one and a half tablet every 12 hours. 24 MAQ per day divided by eight MAQs in one tablet, that's three tablets. So now if you split three tablets into two administrations, that would be one and a half tablet every 12 hours. And after you start this medication, you can recheck an acid-base status in two to three days. And then based on the results, titrate it up or down to make sure you're not overdosing because the overdosing is much worse than underdosing in this case. Mm -hmm.